SBS Insider, and we're going to do a little talk here about how to introduce your SBS to your new aquarium and get off of the right foot. So, Steve, you want to go on and start out? Uh, well, thanks, Ed. Uh, this is our third podcast, and I uh, want to wish everybody a new year. It's 2016, and hopefully will be a best year for everybody. Um, yeah, you, uh, we agreed that the topic today would be acclimation for SPS Corp. And uh, we're all set to go for that. First of all, though, just I'm really happy. I, I got I got a new book out. We'll start with a little advert on that. <laughs> there you go. Should be able to see that. It's good to go. It can be uh, it can be purchased online, and uh, it's a very good book. My best yet. So I think everybody will be pleased with it, and everybody will learn from it. But. Yeah, the topic today is acclimation of SPS, and uh, basically, there's three primary topic, uh, primary uh, concerns with with acclimation. Um, the first one is the, the health assessment. Uh, you need to assess the coral for its health, see how healthy it is. That will determine the kind of uh, how how you have to handle it. Then um, there's the acclimation itself, and that's followed by the quarantine and dip procedures and if we get to it there's also a fourth topic but we probably won't get to it that would be you know how to place it in your tank it's it's orientation and positioning but the first topic would be assessing the health okay okay so do you want me to continue on then right what is right. A good, what's a good health coral like look like what's a good healthy coral, what's a good healthy coral look like ah yeah Okay, well, uh, we're going to approach this from a position of uh, somebody fairly new to it. So some of this stuff may be basic for the uh, advanced guys. But first of all, okay, you, ha you have a coral that you want to put in your tank. You know, how did you get it? Was it shipped to you? Um, did you go to the store, pick it up and all that? It'll probably be in a bag of water, uh, more, 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 more than likely. So if it was just shipped to you, it's probably been in that bag for 24 hours. So the first thing you, the first thing you need to do is to look at the... Uh, the water in the bag. What you want to see is crystal clear water. Okay, if it's got any color at all or it's cloudy, that's the first indication that you have problems, that the coral was uh, stressed during shipping. Um, if it's brown, some of the internal algae were probably expelled. Um, I've actually seen even like a bag that a pink bacillopora was shipped in from Fiji it actually turned pinky brown because the pink pigments came off the coral too. So. But that's the first thing you need to do is look at the water clarity. And then the second thing you need to do is smell the water after you open the bag up. If you have any bad order odors, like rotten odors, um, uh, kind of sulfury odors, you've got, you got problems. But um, uh, once you have, have assessed, you know, the, the, how the coral, the health of the coral. Okay. And, and the other thing you want to see is if the water is clear, you want to see, assess the polyp extension. Because the coral was probably, if it was shipped in a box, it's been in in um, in dark for probably about you know 20, 24 hours. So its polyp should be extended. Um, if it came back from a store, it, it may not have been dark too long. But you, at any rate, you want to see good polyp extension on 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 the coral. Uh, and um, so that's the first thing you need to do is assess its health. Is it is it heavily stressed? Is it moderately stressed is it minorly stressed minor minorly stressed or is it not stressed at all um those are the options and that that will affect how you handle it um so some of the difficult just so you know there are easy to ship corals and there are sps corals and there are difficult to ship sps corals. some of the easier ones are like your bacillopora your styloporas your seriatopora bird's nest those corals ship very easily and uh they usually don't have problems, but they can. But uh, the difficult to ship corals are your slimers, your heavy slimers. And uh, that would be like your acropora and corals like that. And the reason they slime is when they're stressed or bothered uh, or they're exposed to air, they release the slime as like a protective coating. It, it retains their moisture when they're exposed to air. And, uh, and it's just a stress reaction in, in, in a lot of cases. And... Uh, in fact, uh, back in the, um, uh, the 
late 1990s, mid to late 1990s, we actually got these Australia gyro zellies shipped in from Solomon's, whole, whole colonies. And that is probably one of the most sliming corals out there. It slimes excessively. And believe it or not, most of the colonies came in uh, that were in water were dead. And they didn't live because the slime was so excessive. It, you know, uh, it, it, it creates so much bacterial activity that the oxygen content just drops down to nothing. But, but the corals that poked holes in the bags and were dry, those were the ones that lived. <laughs> you know, so there's, but that's just a weird coral. That's a very strange coral. Um, okay, so you've, you've gotten a coral, you've assessed its health. Okay, let's say it's in clear water, its polyps are out, doesn't smell, it's a healthy coral. So you want to get it, you want to acclimate it and get it in your tank. If it's got problems, you're going to have to deal with it differently. Um, and in some cases, you may have to, you know, pretty much give up on it because it's just not going to live and you don't want it to pollute your new system. And uh, that's something I want to say here right right, right, uh, right now, just to give some people advice, uh, some advice on this on the, the topic. One thing you don't want to do, okay, I know people think it's a good thing to do, uh, but if a friend of yours or your reef buddy has corals that are having problems and they you know, ask you to take care of their corals for them or to, or to make them healthy and all that or to keep them for a while, it's not a good idea. Uh, it, uh, just about every situation, most of, the situ most of the times, that will lead to problems in your tank because you're taking somebody else's problems and you're putting them in your tank. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard of people introduce problems into their tanks by doing that. I, it's, it's, you know, it's much better, you, you know, your, your primary concern is with your corals and your tank. Those, those, those should be the things that are most important and help. Uh, what the other person should do is set up another tank, you know, and try to solve their, save their corals there. Um, but um, anyways, we'll get back to the uh, acclimation now. What you want to do is determine the temperature that the coral is in. Hopefully it's within range, which would be, you know, 72 to 82 would be a nice range to be in for temperature. Um, you can actually take the temperature with a digital, digital thermometer or a floater, or even use your fingers if you don't have anything. You can just uh, basically uh, feel your tank water and then feel your uh, shipping water. You want to see them fairly close. Um, but you need to assess the difference in temperature. If it's a, a major difference, then your acclimation period should be longer. If it's a minor difference, then you don't, you know, it's you don't have to increase your acclimation longer for the temperature. Um, also, too, you want to uh, uh, check the, if you can, check the salinity. That's a lot of people don't think of that. But if it's an expensive coral and you don't want to lose it, uh, that's probably a good idea. And you want to see how far the temperature of your, or the, the salinity of your tank is compared to the salinity of the shipping water. Um, and also, too, important for SPS corals is KH. You should really check the KH that the water was shipped in. Because nowadays, people have KH levels all over the place. You know, uh, some of the tank systems run low KH that are close to natural seawater, which is down to 7, 7.5, something like that, D DKH. And other people run 9 to 10. Some people can be higher if they have a aggressive calcium reactor on their system. They could be up to 12, 13, 14. So... A lot of corals are lost, like when people will take like a, a coral that was used to, let's say, seven to eight DKH, and they stick it in their tank with a half an hour acclimation, and all of a sudden it's it's at you know 13, 12 DKH. It's, you know, it's going to cause major stress problems. And um, for soft corals, instead of KH, you may want to look at pH. But what I basically do is, um, uh, I've actually been on contract to write a book about SPS corals now for probably 15 years. <laughs> And I've done some preliminary work on that book. Uh, it's for microcosms, James Lawrence. Uh, I think he might control Coral Magazine here in the U.S. now. I'm not sure, but um, I know he did it one time. But uh, I did some preliminary work on this years ago. So, But basically what you want to do is uh, start off from a, a base point of a one-half hour acclimation, okay? A half an hour acclimation where you uh, slowly add your tank water to the shipping water. But, but uh, before that, though, if... If the shipping water was cloudy and smells, you don't, and the coral is actually losing tissue, you probably want to discard the shipping water right away and get the coral, no matter what, get the coral into some good water because it's stressed, it's dying. The longer it stays in that water, the more it's going to have problems. Okay, so that's one thing you do differently if, if the water's cloudy and colored. 
get it out of that water right away and get it into some good water. If the water is clear, though, you want you got a healthy coral. You're starting with a healthy coral. You don't have to try to save it. You want to just get it to keep growing. So you, at that point, you start off with a one half hour acclimation and then assess the difference in temperature, salinity, and KH. Uh, if it's off big, big, uh, big parameters, add a half an hour to your acclimation. Let's say, for example, if it was shipped in, if it's kind of cold and, and you got the coral, let's say it's 70 degrees, your tank's uh, 75, 76, instead of a half an hour, you'll add a half an hour. You give it a one hour acclimation. So slow down the drip rate, you know, slowly acclimate it over a one hour period. And salinity, every uh, 0.002 specific gravity difference, you probably want to add another half an hour to the acclimation. KH, every uh, two DKH, add another half an hour to your acclimation. So um, let's say you got a coral in, the water's clear, the polyps are out, it looks healthy, there's no tissue recession. Look, look for tissue recession too. There's no tissue recession, but however, the temperature is, is off by five degrees from your tank and the KH is uh, off by let's say three, DKH. So what you wanna do then is take your initial half an hour acclimation, add a half an hour because the temperature is, is off by, more, by four degrees or more, and add another half an hour for the DK, DKH being different so you got a one and a half hour acclimation for that coral. That's just a guide. It's not an exact thing, but it's 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 a guide that'll help you uh, acclimate your a coral from one environment to a, a new environment. Um, now, the way you acclimate, of course, is you put it in a small container with if and if, and use it shipping water if it was clear, and then you slowly add water from your system. You know, and make sure that the temp. You know, if it's in a bag, the best thing to do is float it. You know. Um, just float it for a half an hour, an hour, or whatever, and this, the temperature will slowly uh, stabilize and you know, reach equilibrium. Um, if it's a lot of corals from the same shipper, you can put it in a bucket, put them all in a bucket, you know, and then slowly drip your water into that bucket. But um, that's base, the basic acclimation. But the main thing is to assess the health of the coral. If it's healthy, then you go to this half hour acclimation and add a half an hour for every variable that's off significantly. Uh, if it's if the bag water is cloudy and it's not healthy, um, then what you want to do is uh, possibly get it out of that water as quickly as possible, get it into clean water. And at that point, you're just trying to stabilize it. But one of the things is uh, I used to handle a lot of corals that were coming in from Fiji uh, back in the early days when it was first when they were first coming in, and they were pretty roughed up back then. Um, and some of them were so roughed up that they were so stressed when you actually took the coral after the acclimation and you put it in your, in your tank. Back then we didn't dip a lot. We just did like iodine dips. But when you, when you put it in your tank, you would actually see as, it, as the coral went in the water, you could actually see like a cloud come out of the coral where it's, uh, I don't know, the zooxanthellae were just expelled in mass or the pigments just came out of the coral. But usually when that happened, it meant the coral is dying, you know, and, and you probably shouldn't keep it in your tank. Um, also to smell the coral. You know, acropora can have a pretty, pretty nasty smell, uh, but it, but it, it's kind of a sweet smell. You, you can kind of, and that's because of the the algae are producing sugars. So there's a lot of sugar compounds in there, so it's a little sweet. Um, you want to have a, like a slightly sweet, sweet smell to it. Uh, if it's rotten at all, that means it's, it's probably got problems. So, but that covers the. Uh, oh, we got through that pretty quick. That covers the the health assessment and the acclimation. And the next thing would be to dip into quarantine procedures. Right. I know I, I've started using my, uh, I have one of those um, IM uh, drip gadgets. I've started using with mine and did, did, did just did one of those. I'll add pictures of that to this part of the uh, talk. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, any, any, any slow drip you can do like that, you know, or just an air hose uh, with a little bit of a closure on it, you know. Um, on the air valve to give you a little drip but uh yeah just slowly drip your tank water in, into it and you know and back it off or adjust the rate so you know once you determine how long you want the acclimation to be an hour half hour hour and a half whatever you know just adjust the drip rate so and when when the acclimation is done you want to have about you know 75 to 80 percent of your tank water in in the volume of water that the corals are in and about 25 to 20 percent of the shipping water you know, at that point, it would be uh, it would reach at uh, acclimation. That's correct. 
That's, I, uh, the hardest part, I think, is on something like that is to get something that is uh, uh, a vessel big enough to handle that kind of water volume when you switch them around. You know, that's the hardest part, I think. Yeah, buckets, five gallon buckets is usually the, the easiest thing to do. Um, most people nowadays are, are, are working with uh, small fragments, so just a bowl, a plastic bowl is fine. Um, yeah, but if you're working with colonies, you know, it, it has to be something different, but uh, something much larger, obviously. All right. So, what was the next talk we were going to talk about on, the, on your list? <laughs> Well, the next part would be the uh, the dip dip into quarantine. Okay. Um, okay, but let's say you've 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 got your coral in. Uh, it uh, the bag water was clear, the polyps were out. There was no nasty odor. Odor. You acclimated it in a half an hour to an hour. Okay. You're not done yet. <laughs> you don't. You know, you, you, there's still some more. What you want to do? One of the first things you want to do is is inspect the coral now. Okay. Uh, you want to see if there's any uh, pests or parasites on the coral that could cause problems. Um, sometimes there are small uh, fish in colonies, little little goby fish. Sometimes there are crabs and stuff that can be in corals. And one of the things that we've seen every now and then on coral colonies is uh, snails. They're actually they're actually snails that eat coral. Um, uh, Drupella is an acro eating snail. Um, there's also coral. Let me see if I can pronounce this. Coralliophila snails that eat stylos and stuff. And they sometimes they can be hard to see. They can actually be camouflaged really well. But if you see one, a snail in the colony, you want to pull it out of there, um, especially if it's in the tissue area. And then also look for any uh, uh, any tiny parasites or, or, or pests. Um, nowadays, unfortunately, it's uh, we have to deal with a lot of a lot more pests. Uh, than we did back in the day, back in the 90s. Um, there's just uh, a whole group of things you have to you have to look for. But one of the things that, that I like to do, because some of these these pest parasites are, 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 are very tiny, one of the things I like to do is whenever I get any new corals in or new frags, I always take a close-up picture of them with, you know, with a macro shot. And uh, it's just for catalog purposes, so you can keep track of what you, what you got in and all that. But you can also take that image, put it up on your computer, get it up on a you know big screen, and zoom in, and look look around the coral that way. That's uh, you can actually look pretty 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 closely at the coral. And you want to look for basically with Acropora nowadays we have that I can think of. Oh oh, and one of the other things you need to look for is believe it or not, on Acro, we actually saw a crown of thorns uh, starfish come in once on a colony. A little, wow. It was a little baby one. It was kind of cool looking, but uh, yeah. Not something we wanted in the tank, but but nowadays with acro, there's there's basically four that you have to look for, and that would of course be what we call the red bugs. Now those you'll probably only be able to see really well on a close-up image. So so you know, or if you have a magnifying glass, look at it with a magnifier. But uh, you'll want you, you see little bugs, little tiny specks on the coral that are kind of reddish. They got a red spot on them. That's what we call the red bugs. The, um, um, but if you see those, we treat those with, with, with an interceptor drug that's basically a dog worm medicine, and it's, I heard it's now available again. They're starting to sell it again. Um, the other thing you want to look for is flatworms, acro-eating flatworms, and they're very difficult to see because they look basically just like the tissue. Um, but that's something that you would, you would be able to spot in a, in a close-up image. Um, but another way you can find those is uh, by noticing uh, like white trails or, or, or white spots on the on your coral where they those have been eating the coral. That's that's another way to spot or, or to see their little eggs. They like to leave these little spherical eggs down at the base of the coral in the uh, dead tissue area. Um, those are the two major ones. Now we also have uh, there's also nudibranchs out there that. Um, they eat monopora. Everybody, a lot of people are probably aware of those. They're they're pretty hard to eradicate once they're in your system. So you do not want to you do not want to get them in your system. Um, but they're little white, fluffy little nudibranchs, um, and uh, they will you will actually see areas of the coral that have been eaten. You know, be kind of whitish where the tissue's gone. 
And there's also uh, something else we have to worry. And there's also actually a nudibranch that eats acro. And I think there's more than one. I think there's a couple different species, maybe more. Um, we've seen them come in from just about every every exporter. Um, and uh, there's probably people out there right now. I, I know of at least one store that's uh, had to deal with them. And I've actually seen one that was probably about eight years ago. And I, I just discarded the coral it was on. Um, but that isn't that is an issue. Um, and with the nudibranchs, you know, if you do get them in your system, you know, one of the ways you can deal with them is with grasses and, and, and uh, uh, predators like that. Now, the other one we found, of course, we talked about this earlier, would be sea spiders. You, you, now, uh, some of the sea spiders are so tiny on the acro that you really can't see them. But about the only way you could tell they were there is uh, if you dip it, you'll you'll see the dead ones floating around in the uh, dipping fluid. But uh, iodine kills them in really quickly within a couple minutes. Uh, uh, it, and iodine dip. That's why I, I tell everybody nowadays to do a do a full strength uh, Lugol's iodine dip, just because of the sea spiders, because they're they were in a lot of export facilities. I hear. Uh, um, so <clears throat> one of the iodine dips we recommend back in the day. This was a an old recommendation from uh, Mike Poeta, I believe. But uh, you basically take Lugol's, which is a five percent iodine, and put ten drops per liter in your dipping water and uh, dip the coral for about 10 to 20 minutes now uh but back when we started that's basically all we had was the uh, iodine uh, there was no uh, any other dips available on the market um but nowadays you know uh, our uh, aquarium hard goods sellers have come up with some good products for us they've uh we've got sea chem as reef dip two little fishes has revive uh, there's also coral rx coral dip Brightwell Aquatics, Metacoral, and uh, all those are, are well-tested products. You know, use the recommendation on the product, um, and it'll tell you what it kills and all that. But uh, now, when, when you do dip a coral, um, what you want to do is the, the thinner corals, thinner corals um, actually should be dipped less time. You want to be really careful with them. The thinner the branches, like like a thin plating monopora or a thin stag, deep water stag. They're real sensitive to, to dips. With, um, so, you know, use a, don't leave them in a dip, you know, uh, accidentally. Uh, but, you know, cut your dip times down to the bare minimum. The thicker the coral is, like a thick humulus, acropora humulus, or a thick massive monopora, those can actually be dipped, you know, fairly long, you know, at the maximum recommended times for the dipping products. Um, there's also a, uh, a, a product that you can get, believe it or not, from uh, Home Depot uh, called Bear, a Bear product. It's, it's actually a, uh, I believe it's for, uh, it's, 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 a pet, it's a pesticide for gardens and stuff. But uh, there are dip procedures for that. But a lot of the deep water corals, a lot of the people that deal with the thin deep water acros use the Bear dip um, uh, because the corals seem to survive that much better. But you can, uh, there's there's actual laid out procedures for that online. That just people search for bear dip, acro, uh, coral bear dip, B-A-Y-E-R. Right. That's a very popular dip that people use a lot of times. They get from Home Depot. I heard that quite a bit. So. Yeah, I actually have a picture of the actual product you want to buy on my phone here. Let me see if I can, um, if I can bring it up for you. But, um, yeah, those but are the things that I am. Um, also wanted to, you know, what I use is a jeweler's uh, headset, you know, I got it from work, I use it at work, and it's got the magnifying, and I can get in real close and see if there's anything on the corals, that helps out a whole lot for for your eyes and be able to see things, you know, especially the, the acro uh, flatworms have really super small eggs, and so you can see that, put your jeweler's headset on and look down close, you can really catch the, uh, that kind of stuff more coral. Maybe you can see that. Get the glare right. out of there. Right. Uh-huh. That's a good stuff. Yeah, that's that's the product you want. Right. Okay. Get that off my phone. Yeah, so the last topic here on the acclimation would be, um, uh, you know, okay, you've, 
you've, you've got a healthy coral, its polyps were out, the bag water was clear, the bag water smelled good. You did a 20 minute or 30 minute to one hour acclimation. Then uh, you examined the coral really closely for any pest parasites or anything like that. You determined it was clean, but you did a precautionary dip. You know, nowadays I say give it a you know 10, 20 minute iodine dip, see if anything comes off or see what comes off. Because some, if it's a colony, you, you, you'll see something come off. You know, so it may just be a, a crab or something, some, you know, like an acro crab, something that's not a problem. But but it's kind of cool because you can see what comes off the coral then and, and see what was on the coral. But you, or if it's a frag, you give it a 10 minute iodine dip, you see, okay, he, ha he doesn't have sea spiders. And then you may want to follow that up with uh, a regular coral dip with one of the products we mentioned, one of the four products we mentioned. Okay, so you've uh, you've acclimated it, you've dipped it, it's ready to go in your system. It's a healthy coral now. If it's not, if it's not healthy, you wanna you wanna you know maybe you may not want to put it in your system right away. You you, you know you may want to uh, give it a longer a, dip, a quarantine procedure and all that. But but we, uh, it's it's best nowadays to use a quarantine. To have a small quarantine tank for at least a week. You know um, I actually go probably three to four weeks in, in quarantine stuff I bring in and one of the things I do is um, because of all the pests and parasites we have nowadays is I, I never put a rock or a plug from somebody else's tank in my main tank because uh, if there's a little if there's a little baby sea spider on there or a, or a flatworm egg you may not see them uh, uh, and it could be attached to the plug you know, or the rock so what I usually do is you know you got a coral sitting here on a, on a rock and you just you know clip off the uh, clip off the living tissue and leave the encrusting on the rock, and then you can you can actually once you've dipped the coral and acclimated it, uh, you you can take that frag and then remount it and then put it in your main tank. Um, then it, it gives you I think uh, that's the same procedure Jason Fox uses, and uh, who could argue with that? I mean the guy's got probably one of the best collections in in the, in the country that he's uh, he's put together. Um, and then you could take the encrusting part and put it in your quarantine or to even discard it, you know, but uh, I, I would definitely not put in uh, the base section, you know, but uh, okay. So you're, you've got your coral now, you're ready to put it in your main tank or your quarantine, you know, definitely use a quarantine if you can, because there may be something you missed. Um, and uh, what, what you want to do is, um, if, if the coral is heavily stressed, uh, what usually happens, it's hard to see it, but what usually happens is the tissue uh, will retract kind of into the skeleton. So the coral will have like a rough appearance. Um, if you put it in your, if you put it in a quarantine tank and it's, it's probably gonna be, have that rough appearance probably because it's been stressed from shipping. Um, it could take like four to 10 days for the coral to recover. But the way you tell it's recovered from that stress is the tissue will look puffy it'll puff up i call it puffy it'll 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 expand away from the skeleton it won't look rough it'll look kind of more full more puffy um that's when it's recovered and its polyps will be out you know that's when it's recovered and you can and at that point you can you know if it looks good in your quarantine and there's no pest or parasites you can consider placing it in into your main tank but um what you what you want to do now is you okay you're 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 placing it in your tank. Um, uh, oh yeah, there's also other products nowadays that actually help, like uh, RTN stops and RTN destroyer. So if you had a coral that was in cloudy water and it, and it smells and you're trying to save it, you can try one of those RTN destroyer or RTN stop products that, that are out there. I've heard people use them and they've been uh, kind of successful with them. They're, they're amazing products. I don't know how they work, I can speculate, but. I don't want to tread on anybody's uh, trademark or patented method, um, but um, okay. So you're uh, you're placing your coral into its new environment. What you want to do is uh, determine what kind of environment it needs. Now, the person that shipped it, or the store owner that you picked it up from, maybe they didn't tell you exactly what it needed. But uh, which uh, one of the ways to tell is looking again at the, the thickness. Or the thinness of a coral. If it's a if it's a thin coral, it's um, going to need probably less current, weak current. And also, too, uh, 
corals that are slightly stressed or heavily stressed probably should not be exposed to very strong water currents. I've actually seen heavy stressed corals um, be placed into strong water current and the tissue gets blown right off the skeleton because the, uh, it, when it's stressed, it, the, the tissue kind of kind of loses its attachment and all that. So you want to be a little careful uh, with stress corals. You know, do not expose them to bright light or strong current. Um, put them down low in a quarantine tank with low light, low current. But you want to give them light right away because they've they if they were shipped to you, they've they've been without light for probably 24 hours, you know, maybe longer. Um, and if it's a thicker, massive coral, you know, it's going to need more current. So stronger current would be would be better. And also, too, a lot of people don't know about don't, don't know about this, but um, let's just say we got a okay. Let's just see. Okay, we got a coral here. Okay, all right. It was sitting in your tank. It was getting light here. Okay. This part of it is 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 brightly colored because of the light, and this part doesn't have much color. It's just brown. Okay. Well, you don't want to put it in your tank like this. Okay, <laughs> because it's gonna this color will be lost, and you'll have to redevelop it up here. You want to put it in. You know. Uh, figure out how the light was hitting the coral, where where in the tank it came from. You know, figure out its orientation, and then reposition it that way, so the colorful spots are getting light again. Um, then the coral can actually not go through too much acclimation because it will have to acclimate into the new environment because the lighting's different. It's coming from different angles. You know, nowadays with LEDs and T5s, that's less of an issue. But back in the days with halides. It was it was a it was a pretty pretty important issue. Um, I, I call it the, col the the color side. You know, put put the coral in there, color side up. <laughs> you know? um, and uh, but you you should also expect that it, that any any coral you get, any SPS especially, probably lost some some of its color during shipping. It got stressed, and it and if depending on how how long the acclimation in your in, in the in the photo acclimation is in your new tank, it could take a while for it to redevelop. So what you should normally see is a little bit of weakening in, in colorful pigments, and then the coral should puff up, get healthy, polyps out, and the color should slowly come back. That's an intensify. That's, that's the best possible situation. Um, and uh, let's see here. I think we covered it all. Wow, we got through that pretty quickly. It's because, probably because you didn't have so too many questions, Ed. I was able to go right through the material. But uh, I guess now we could do the question period if you have any. Well, it's, and, uh, it's, our connection is kind of wonky today, so I want to be quiet. You know that. <laughs> I, I forgot my earplugs, so I, it's hard yeah. for me to hear on my, on my pad. Do you uh, do you consider a problem of uh, how long? Like sometimes corals have a problem after two weeks in a tank. And those kind of get RTN or STN. What usually causes that? You think? Okay, so you're talking about a situation where the coral looked pretty good when you got it in, and you put it in your tank, and then two weeks later, the tissue starts coming off of it? Right. It's a colony? Or just a frag. I see a lot of people posting things. That are, they're, it looked great for two weeks, and then and, uh, overnight, it's gotten white. It started RTN and up the top, to the top of the coral. What do you yeah, see? That. You know, a lot of times when it when it goes at the top, I I think it's like a uh, carbonate re related issue for like KH and stuff. Mm -hmm. It could have been the pH was way off, because uh, or let's say a little bit off, and the coral's having trouble. But but obviously, it, to me, when I hear that situation, if it's not a colony from Fiji, which typically a lot of those colonies have that problem, and uh, if it's a fragment or something, the uh, it tells me that it's having trouble adapting to your new environment. Um, there could be a lot of reasons causing that. Um, it could be related to, uh, you know, bacterial levels. Uh, the lighting could be too strong. Um, if the, basically, though, if, if the lighting is too weak, the coral should slowly, uh, like, darken, and then, and then its base will turn kind of white, whitish. Not lose tissue, but turn kind of whitish. That means it wasn't given, getting enough light. If it's too much light, the top of the coral, the color side, will get kind of whitish, and the bottom will get dark. But that's that's a light issue. That's how you tell you got a lighting issue. Um, but yeah, there's that's that's one of the tough parts when the coral starts dying at the tips. Typically, 
when it's an environmental stress issue, it'll it'll start receding down in the base area, you know. Um, but uh, in that case, you might want to try one of those RTN uh, destroyer products or RTN stop products because uh, it could have gotten infected. Because a lot of times you will have remounted it to a new plug and who knows, the, the cutting procedure, the remount procedure could have got it infected. Or it, maybe it's being exposed to a pathogen in your tank it's, it's not used to, you know, and it's getting infected. Or another possibility is you have a, a, a fish or something that's pecking at it or a crab that's eating it. Um, especially if it's the first time you put that type of coral in your tank. But, uh, you know, that's that's one of the tougher issues when it's when it starts dying at the, at the tips. That's, that's it's a little bit more difficult to assess. Right. It's uh, well, those kind of things you get. I see a lot of on the forum. We get people say that you know, it was looking good when I left for work this morning. When I came home, it's halfway dead, you know, kind of thing. It's hard really to say for particularly point out one thing that could be a problem. There could be several problems like lighting. Uh, maybe your uh, DKH has changed over course of period of time. Um, what about salinity? Would salinity rises change, uh, do a lot of stuff like that? Well, monopore are especially sensitive to salinity changes. If, if, uh, if you even have like a little piece of salt crud fall off the edge of the tank and land on the coral, on a monopore, it, it, will, it will kill the actual coral. So I'm getting a phone call here. I have to put that. No. Okay. Hung up on you know, that's, one of, that's one of the things I always watch when I'm, I never, Salt creep, I never clean it off into the tank. I always take it off away from it and try to shake it off of the tank because it's – I've had that happen myself where a piece of salt creep gets on a coral and will almost burn it, you know, and kill it, kill a spot, and then that leads inevitably to a problem down the road, you know. So oh, yeah. I've had people come into my tank and say, oh, Steve, you got salt crud, and they'll wipe the salt crud into the tank. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Right. No, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my fault. I should have not let the salt crud uh, yeah. form. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of easy for me now in my tank that I have now, as you've seen in my living room, it's easy for me to wipe the salt creep because it's right there. But when I had tanks in the basement, it's easy to get salt creep everywhere, you know, and you get in a, and you've got a whole bunch of tanks going. But uh, I wanted yeah. to, we want to promote your book again before we let you go. And, uh, I want to tell people what the book is about a little bit, before, and I'll pull a, post a big picture of it here when you talk about it. You want to talk about the book a little bit, what's the topic, and yeah, there you go. You'll send me that link, uh, send me a picture, and I'll, I'll, t I'll, uh, I'll put it on here. What is, the, what is the main topic of the book, that you, this new book you got out? The main topic, uh, well, that's a good one. Uh, basically... <laughs> It's uh, centered around a, the live sponge filtration method uh, that I kind of experimented with. It's it's basically now, um, I, I wrote a book about that in, in 2000, and it was kind of speculative, speculative back then because there wasn't much science behind, behind it, but there's been a lot more research now, and there's a whole lot of sci science behind it now. And so it is a... Uh, uh, it's, it's a formal method defined by science and everything. Um, and it's basically probably the most, one of the most important filtrate, I guess, I don't know if you call it filtration, but one of the, the most important nutrient cycles that, that occurs on reefs is between the photosynthetic uh, uh, corals, the uh, autotrophs, and the, um, the cave dwelling sponges, uh, the uh, heterotrophs. And there's a, a nutrient exchange that occurs between them but the book is more than that it's much much more than that um i guarantee you you're going to learn something and you're going to find out you're probably doing something you shouldn't be doing right now but i'm not the kind of person that's going to go out there and tell you not to do things it, you know uh you make enemies that way <laughs> and uh i've had i've made a few of those over the years you know you've been in the, this business 25 years that, that definitely happens um but uh, I think that to be blunt about it, I think it's extremely important to the uh, to the reef keepers uh, hobby. Um, you need you, you need you need this material because it's not just material about my system, but it's uh, I found a lot of cool 
you know, cool research nowadays because you can take your take your phone, hook it up to the internet, sit at your desk in front of two computers, and download scientific papers nowadays. It's pretty awesome. At least the ones that don't, that aren't charging you forty dollars a paper, you know. Uh, but uh, you download them, and, and they're you know, in the, back in the days when I wrote my first book, I mean, I was in uh, Scripps Scripps. Scripps in La Jolla, their, their library. I'd go down there, two, three hour drive down the library, spend five hours down there finding articles and copying them on paper, and lugging stacks of paper back to the office, you know, and uh, that takes a lot of time and it slows the whole process down. And, uh, but nowadays uh, you just download them to your phone. And so I found a whole lot of articles that are really, really important to the, to the reef hobby. Um, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe maybe the next time, uh, uh, Steve, we can have a talk about what are your favorite uh, uh, research sites that uh, you think people should know about on the on the net that'll kind of help them learn the process and and, and find find this kind of information. I know I'm like you. I used to go down to the library and get the microfish out and start searching for all these pieces of paper. And in in my attic here, I have probably seven boxes full of Xerox research papers from back in the day. And uh, it's, there's always a good one. There's always a good few sites that we can get on and you can recommend that uh, for people to research about just about corals. There's a, there's good sites, just uh, information we can get on corals and uh, coral researchers. You know, there's tons of information all the time coming out. And I know you're you're like me. You always want to find out the latest information people are uh, are uh, publishing lately, so we can keep up to date on what on how to keep these animals we love in our tanks. Yeah, and there's a there's a lot of obscure scientific journals and and magazines and stuff that uh, you know are very difficult to find. Uh, but yeah. but you can get on the web nowadays and search for your topics. It's basically a topic search, and Google searches and Yahoo searches are getting very good, and they they lead you to uh, to uh, some of these articles that, that you can download. And uh, you know the reading's kind of tough. The reading's kind of tough, but uh, you know if if you uh, give it some time, you know, and, and read it a few times, you, you can definitely find some really good information. Right. I used to use a uh, use like a uh, like a, a highlighter and kind of just highlight things that I as I read through it, you know, to figure out, cause some of it's all gobbledygook to the re they're doing uh, scientific. Uh, I'm saying they almost have like a Google translator to figure out what they're saying. <laughs> some of these things, you know, but uh, you can actually pick up a lot of great information uh, on corals and uh, the ocean, uh, ocean cycles in the about with sponges and autotropes and, and go back and forth. You can really pick up a lot of good information that way. So, well, we're gonna. I'm gonna. I got to get off here, and I'm gonna download you, uh, buy your book. I recommend everybody buy Steve's book because you'll get a lot of great information from it. And uh, the yeah, Ed, or not, you, you might even learn one or two things at. That's right. I know it's a shock. I know it's kind of a shock. You've you've been there, done it, but it is possible. It's possible. It's possible. I always I always learn something every day. If you can't learn something in the hobby every day. Uh, then you're not doing it right, you know. There's always something new to learn, you know. And I, I'm always searching all over the world for insights. And I've, I love Google Translator now that you can actually translate uh, languages back and forth and talk to people. I'm talking to people in Poland right now about how they're uh, keeping corals. And uh, uh, it's always fun and things to new, to, new things to learn from everybody. And uh, I yeah, want to... They they actually love my book in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, but they can't read it, so they're not buying it. <laughs> well, you can probably Google Translate it. I'm sure, probably pretty much halfway, you know, to where they can understand some of it, you know. But uh, again, talk to you next month, Steve, and uh, everybody have a good good time and go get Steve's book for sure. Okay, you'll learn a lot of great stuff about uh, your reef aquarium. Bye bye, Steve. Okay.